Good morning, friends. On many occasions, Krilenko drives his actors to tones of exhaustion. Thanks to the nonsense, they are compelled to grind out over and over again, like a bad play in which the actor is ashamed for the dramatist, and yet has to go on and on anyway to keep body and soul together. Krilenko, do you agree? Fedotov, I agree, even though in general I do not think Krilenko. Do you confirm this? Fedotov, properly speaking, in certain portions, and so to speak in general, yes. For the engineers, those who are still free, not yet imprisoned, and who had to face the necessity of working cheerfully after the defamation at the trial of their whole class, there was no way out. They were damned if they did and damned if they didn't. If they went forward, it was wrong. If they went backward, it was wrong too. If they hurried, they were hurrying for the purpose of wrecking. If they moved methodically, it meant wrecking by slow down, slowing down tempos. If they were painstaking and developing some branch of industry, it was intentional delay, sabotage. And if they indulged in capricious leaps, their intention was to produce an imbalance for the purpose of wrecking. Using capital for repairs, improvements, or capital readiness was tying up capital funds. And if they allowed equipment to be used until it broke down, it was divisionary action. In, a t in addition, the interrogators would get all this information out of them by subjecting them to sleeplessness and punishment cells, and then demanding that they give convincing examples of how they might have carried on wrecking activities. Give us a clear example. Give us a clear example of your wrecking activity. The impatient Krilenko urges them on. They will give you outstanding examples. Just wait. Soon someone will write the history of the, te the technology of those years. He will give you examples and negative examples. He will evaluate for you all the convulsions of your epileptic five-year plan in four years. Then we will find out how much of the people's wealth and strength was, was squandered. Then we will find out how all the best patriots were destroyed. Patriots. The best projects were destroyed, and how the worst projects were carried out by the worst means. Well, yes, if the Mao, Mao Tse Tung breed of Red Guard youths supervised brilliant engineers, what good can come of it? Dilettante enthusiasts. They were the ones who egged on their even stupider leaders. Yes, full details are a disservice. Somehow, the more detail, details provided, the less the evil deeds seem to smell of execution. But just a moment. We've not had everything yet. The most important crimes all lie ahead. Here they are, here they come, comprehensible and intelligible to every illiterate. The prom party, one, prepared the way for the intervention, two, took money from the imperialists, and three, conducted espionage, four, assigned cabinet post in a future government. And that did it. All mouths were shut. And all those who had been expressing the reservations fell silent. And only the tramping of demonstrators could be heard and the roars outside the window. Death! 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 What about some more details? Why should you want more details? Well, then, if that's the way you want it, but they will, they will only be more frightening. They were all acting under orders from the French general staff. After all, France doesn't have enough worries or difficulties or party conflicts of its own, and it is enough just to whittle, and lo and behold, divisions will march. To whistle, and, <laughs> and divisions will march. Intervention. First they planned it for 1928, but they couldn't come to an agreement. They couldn't tie up all the loose ends. All right, so they postponed it to 30. But once more they couldn't agree among themselves. All right, 1931 then. And, as a matter of fact, here's how it was to go. France herself would not fight, but, as her commission for organizing the deal, would take the Ukraine right back, the Ukraine right bank as her share. England wouldn't fight either, of course, but in order to raise a scare, promised to send her fleet into the Black Sea and into the Baltic. In return, she would get Caucasian oil. The actual warriors would, for the most part, be the following, 130 emigres, True, they had long since scattered to the four winds, but it would take only a whistle to gather them all together again immediately. Poland, for which she would get half of the Ukraine. Romania, whose brilliant successes in World War I were famous. She was a formidable enemy. And then there was Latvia and Estonia. These two small countries would willingly drop all the concerns of their young governments and rush forth in mass to do battle. And the most frightening thing of all was the direction of the main blow. How's that? Was it already known? Yes. It would begin with Bessarabia, and from there, keeping to the right bank of the of the Dnieper, Dnieper, it would move straight on Moscow. And at that fate, fateful moment, would not all their railroad, railroads certainly be blown up? No, not at all. 
bottlenecks would be created, and the prom party would also yank out the fuses and electrical power sections, stations, and the entire Soviet Union would be plunged into darkness, and all our machinery would come to a halt, including the textile machinery, and sabotage would be carried out. Attention, defendants, you must not name your methods of sabotage, nor the factories which were your objectives, nor the geographic sites involved until the closed session. And you must not name names, whether foreign or our own. Combine all this with the fatal blow which will have been dealt the textile industry by that time. Add the fact that the saboteurs will have constructed two or three textile factories in Bielorussia, Bilo which will serve as a base of operations for the intervention interventionists. With the textile factories already in their hands, the interventionists would march implacably on Moscow. But here was the cleverest part of the whole plot. Though they did not, they didn't succeed in doing so. They had wanted to drain the, the Cuban marshes and the Polisi swamps and the swamp near Lake Ilmen. Vizhinsky had forbidden them to name the exact places, but one of the witnesses blurted them out. <clears throat> and then the, the interventionists would open up the shortest routes and would get to Moscow without wetting their feet or their horses' hoofs. And why was it so hard for the taters? Why was it that Napoleon didn't reach Moscow? Yes, it was because of the Polisi and the Ilmen swamps. And once those swamps were drained, the capital would lie exposed. On top of that, don't forget to add that hangars had been built there under the guise of sawmills, places not to be named, so that the planes of the interventionists would not get wet in the rain and could be taxied into them. And housing for the interventionists had also been built, do not name the places. And where had all the homeless occupation armies been quartered in previous wars? The defendants had received all the directives on these matters from the mysterious foreign gentlemen K and R. It is strictly forbidden to name their names or to name the countries they came from. And most recently, they had even begun the preparation of treasonable actions by individual units of the Red Army. Do not name the branches of the service, nor the units, nor the names of any persons involved. True, they hadn't done any of this. But they had also intended, though they hadn't done that either, to organize within some central army institution, a cell of financiers and former officers of the white armies. Ha, <laughs> the white army, write it down, start making arrests. And cells of anti-Soviet students, students, write it down, start making arrests. Incidentally, don't push things too far. We wouldn't want the workers to get despondent and begin to feel that everything is falling apart and the Soviet government has been caught napping. And so they also threw a good deal of light on that side of it. But they had intended to do it a lot and had accomplished very little and not one industry had suffered serious losses. But why didn't the intervention take place anyway? For various complex reasons, either because Poncaire hadn't been elected in France, or else because our émigré industrialists decided that the former enterprises had not yet been sufficiently restored by the Bolsheviks. Let the Bolsheviks do more, and then, too, they couldn't seem to come to terms with Poland and Romania. So, all right, they ha there hadn't been any intervention, but there was at least a prom party, did you hear the tramp of marching feet? Did you hear the murmur of the working masses? Death, death, death. But the marchers were those who in the event of war would have to atone for, with their deaths and deprivations and sufferings for the work of these men. And it was as if he had looked into a crystal ball. It was indeed with their deaths and deprivations and sufferings that those trusting demonstrators would atone in 1941 for the work of these men. But where is your finger pointing, prosecutor? At whom is your finger pointing? So then, why was it the industrial party? Why the party and not the engineering technical center? We are accustomed to having a center. Yes, there was a center, too, but they had decided to reorganize themselves into a party. It was more respectable. That way, it would be easier to fight over cabinet posts in the future government. It would mobilize the engineering technical masses for the struggle for power. And whom would they be struggling against? Other parties, of course against the Working Peasants' Party, the TKP, in the first place. For after all, they had 200,000 members, against the Menshevik Party in the second place. And as for a center, those three parties together were to have constituted a united center, but the GPU had destroyed them, and it's a good thing they destroyed us. All the defendants were glad. And it was flattering to Stalin to annihilate three more parties. Would they have been... Would there have been any glory indeed in merely adding another three centers to his list? And having a party instead of a center meant having another central committee, yes, the prom party's own central committee. True, there had not been any party conferences, nor, nor had there been any elections, not even one. Whoever wanted to be on the central committee just joined up, 
five people all told. They all made way for one another, and they all yielded the post of chairman to one another, too. There were no meetings, either the, of the central committee, no one else could would remember this, but Romsen would remember it very well indeed, and he would name names, or of the groups from various branches of industry. There seemed even to be some dearth of members. As Chernovsky said, there never was any formal organization of a prom party, and how many members had there been? Larachev, a count of members would have been difficult. The exact composition was unknown. And how had they carried out their wrecking? How had directives been communicated? Well, it was just a matter of whoever met whomever in some particular institution. Directives were passed on orally. From then on, everyone would carry out his own wrecking on his own conscience. Well, now, Ramsen confidently named two thousand members, and whenever he named two, he arrested five. According to the documents in the trial, there were altogether thirty to forty thousand engineers throughout the USSR. That meant they would arrest every seventh one and terrify the other six. And what about contacts with the Working Peasants Party? Well, we might meet. We they might meet in the State Planning Commission or else in the Supreme Council of the Economy and plan systematic acts against village communists. Where have we seen all this before? Aha, in Aida. There are. They are seeing Radam's off on his campaign, and the orchestra is thundering, and eight warriors are standing there in helmets and with spears, and two thousand more are painted on the back and the backdrop. That's your prom party. But that's all right, it works. The show goes on. Today it is quite impossible to believe just how threatening and serious it all looked at the time. <laughs> and it is hammered in by repetition, and every individual episode has gone over several times, and because of the awful visions mul and because of this, the awful visions multiply. And in addition, so that things won't become too bland, the defendants suddenly forget something terribly unimportant, or else they try to renounce testimony. And right then and there, they pin them down with cross-questioning, and it all winds up being as lively as the Moscow Art Theater. But Krylenko pressed too hard. On the one hand, he planned to disembowel the prom party, to disclose its social basis. That was a question of class, and his analysis couldn't go wrong. But Krylenko abandoned the Stanislavsky method, didn't assign the roles, relied on improv improvisation. He let everyone tell his own story of his own life and what his relationship to the revolution had been and how he had led to participate in wrecking. And in one fell swoop, that thoughtless insertion, that human picture spoiled all five acts. That's where we'll stop today, friends. Have a good day.